see, story is powerful. When you, when you hear a fact, it's one thing. You hear a fact and no surrounding context around it, uh, it becomes just a fact. And a lot of times we present the truths of Christ as fact. Here's a fact, now act upon it. But you see, as human beings, when we hear just facts, our brain says, I need to make sense of this. I need to take that fact, that truth, and I need to put it into some kind of context in order to understand it. And if you don't have any context, right, if there's no story surrounding that truth or that fact that's being passed on to you, your brain doesn't hang on to it. Or it becomes this floating, dismembered thing in your head that a uh, pastor said, um, you can't play that third string, you know, and, and you know, you just, no context, no nothing, you, you can't think of it. That's why, that's why we tend towards story. We tell things in terms of story. We operate and think and build our lives around story. Story, for you and I, has some concrete parts. It has a beginning, has a middle, and it has a conclusion. It has an end to it. And just like, just like my situation this morning, if any part of that story is missing, what does your brain do? Your brain says, no, 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 right? We, we, have, we have life, you and I. We share life. And so our story goes like this. Once upon a time, I was born. Once upon a time, you were born. And then some magical, wonderful, awful things happen, and then we're gone. Right? So the beginning is our birth. The middle, the arc of our story, is where all those magical, wonderful, awful things happen. And then we go on to glory. And that's the end. If I tell you a story that says, on November 16th, 1960, I was born and then I passed away. It's not much of a story to you. You're going, hmm, how did he consume the 57 years of time between 1960 and this date today? If I take that part out, the story doesn't mean anything to you. It's, it's like this passing ship that just kind of rolled by in the night. We need all the parts of the story. It works the same way in terms of the Bible. The Bible tells us a complete story. In the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth. And then throughout all the pages of the Bible, some magical, wonderful, awful things happen. And then at the end of the story, the conclusion of the story, the New Jerusalem descends from the heavens, the new heavens and the earth are created, and those of us going on into glory will spend our eternity in those new heavens and earth. So try to picture the story of God without one of those parts, right? If, if, we, if we take the middle out of that story, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We turn the page, and the new Jerusalem descended from the heavens, and the new heavens and the earth were established, and we lived happily ever after. Your brain would rebel. Your brain would say, whoa, whoa, whoa. What was wrong with the old heavens and earth? Why does a new Jerusalem have to be? You know, you, your brain is asking all these questions. And when your brain is processing things in that way, when you're thinking in that way, you can't concentrate on anything else. You, you cannot take the context of, of what God says. You cannot take any of the bits and pieces that we understand about God and put them in any, any context that applies to your life because you're missing the whole middle of the story. That's why why it's important that God 
created the heavens and the earth. They were marred by the original sin, by, by Adam and Eve when they are expelled and humanity is cursed. All kinds of awful and wonderful things happen. The most wonderful being that Jesus Christ is sent as the atoning sacrifice for all humanity. Yay, the story is getting better and better. How can we have a part of that? Simply believe in the finished work of Christ. Awesome. And the story is getting better and better. And they said, well, but, but then what? But then what? Oh, God says, I've taken care of everything. I have paid the price for your sin and... And when I conclude the history of this world, I have an entirely new, sin-free, temptation-free world in which all of my people will spend eternity and live happily ever after. Isn't that a more satisfying story? That fills in the why, 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 why. That fills in why we struggle. That fills in the best thing that could ever happen to it. That fills in all the answers that we need. And listen, when we think in terms of that story, we process things in, in terms of that story. We no longer take the little bits and bites and make them stand by themselves. What is sin? Well, sin is all these things contrary to the will of God. Well, why do I sin? Well, you sin because Adam sinned and God sees everybody as a sinner. Well, what do I do about it? Well, Christ gave his life for it. Well, how do I apprehend that? Well, I, I apprehend that by believing on and, and it answers. Answers and it answers. And when everything is in context, when everything is put in the midst of that story, then it becomes personal, doesn't it? Right? Then it becomes personal. When I stand up here and I say, once upon a time, I was born, bam, that's your story too, isn't it? Right? Once upon a time, you were born. And over the course of my life, some magical and some wonderful and some awful things happen. And you go, wow, that's, that's me too. That's how my life has gone too. And someday, someday I think we all know that we will go on to our eternal glory. And so, so you know, what I say, you say. What the Bible says, we live. What we, what we read, we put it in the context. And that's why story, that's why story is so powerful because we can put ourselves in it. We can see ourselves on the pages of the Bible. We can see ourselves living in the midst of all of these things here. We can see why God calls us to do this and not do this. We can see the ultimate objective that he has for all of humanity. That we would come awake, that we would wake up, and then we would see what he's done for us that we would see in his grace that he has paid the price for sin, that he has set us free, and that it is not this impossible thing to attain. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to work our way up to it. We don't have to find out how to live this sin-free life. All we have to do, all we have to do is accept God's mercy in Jesus Christ, and we're set free. What a great story. What a fantastic story. And if only all the Bible were written like that, it would be so easy to understand. You know, when we, when we read a part of the Bible like Daniel, Daniel is a narrative. It's telling a story. In fact, it's telling several stories, isn't it? Remember the one last week, Daniel met the lions there. You go, well, that's an interesting story. Well, how does, it, how does it begin? Once upon a time, some guys didn't like the fact that Daniel had so much power in Babylon. Once upon a time, some people did not like the fact that Daniel was very popular with the king. He's an exile. He's a Jew. Remember that. He is the enemy of these people here. And so once upon a time, God saw fit to put his exiles in the middle of enemy territory and lift a bunch of them up into positions of power. And that's the beginning of the story. Well, the story of chapter 6 is even simpler. 
those guys saw fit to find a way to damage Daniel, to, to end Daniel. And so they create this false dilemma of, of Daniel not worshiping appropriately, of Daniel continuing to pray when he's told not to, and, no, 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 no. and the king is left with no option but to throw him into the lion's den. Uh-oh, uh-oh, we're reading this story, and you're right on the edge. This is as good as your favorite movie now. You're right. What's going to happen to Daniel when they drop him down that hole? Well, nothing. Nothing happens to Daniel. He doesn't even get a scratch. In fact, he was probably spending the night petting that kitty. Petting that cat and going, I can't wait until morning. We can both get out of here. And, and he does. The king runs down there, takes away the, the cover, and says, Daniel, Daniel, tell me you're okay. And Daniel, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Because God saw fit to take care of me. Whew. And then that's the conclusion of the story. That story fits in the arc of the bigger story. Why does God send his people to Babylon? Because he wants his influence in that enemy kingdom. Why does God allow Daniel and the other teenagers to rise up in power? Because he wants to show that the worship of Yahweh is not only appropriate, it is the way to blessing. It is the way to be taken care of. And so that story and the furnace and the statue and all of those other sub-stories feed in to the truth that Daniel tells, that God is in sovereign control of all things, that no matter what, no matter what you throw in his way, no matter what the enemy thinks he can get away with, no matter what people think they can get away with, God is in control. And he proves that over and over and over. So we take Daniel and we pull that out and we say, well, how does this fit in the context of all the story? Isn't that a great question? Well, awful things happen in our lives. We're faced with lions. We're faced with furnaces. We, we have people who try to do us wrong and so on and so on and so on. All these things, we can identify with all these things. We said, well, well, what's gonna happen at the end? Well, what happened with Daniel? What happened with Job? What happened with all the narrative stories? God exercises his sovereign control of all of history. And he says, at the end of history, I'm going to make everything right. What a great story. And now it's no more, thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. It's not these individual little rules. It's not just a bunch of laws that we have to follow. It's I'm living a part of the greatest story ever told. I'm in it. You're in it. Everybody in the world is in the middle of this story, whether they realize it or not. And yet we get to know the end of the story. When we come to other parts of the Bible, parts that are not written in narrative, when we turn back to the book of Ephesians this week, we go back here, we're left with a different question. How does this fit in the middle of the story? You got a Bible, grab one and turn to chapter five in Ephesians. Now, believe it or not, there's story here. There's a powerful story. And even though we're looking at a letter and we look at a lot of prescriptive things, that is Paul telling the church at Ephesus how to act and how not to act, there's still a story here. And I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read a little bit today. I'm gonna read from chapter, uh, chapter five, verse three, down to verse 14. And I'm telling you that because we want to start at the end, okay? Verse 14 goes like this. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Wake up, O oh sleeper, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now, pull that out of context. Take it all by itself, and you're going, what, what is this about? Who, who is this sleeper? Only a few of you are sleeping right now. But, but you know, who, who is this sleeper that the Bible is referring to? It can't, it can't be me. I'm not asleep. And 
oh, there must be a deeper story here. Remember, everything is told in the context of the story. Wake up, sleeper, rise up from the dead. Who's this dead person that he's referring to? I want to know more. I want to see how this fits in the story. Well, we know the context. We know that, that somebody is sleeping. Somebody is in the dark. Somebody is dead. But Christ can shine upon that person. I want to find out more. Well, I'm going to roll back just a few verses. I'm going to go back to verse 8. Here's the truth that Paul lays out. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what, is the, what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. And then, that's why it's said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. You know, one of the things that is common about story, about any story, is that that middle part is some kind of a journey. It's some kind of a quest. It is reaching towards the objective that concludes the story. The quest, the hero's quest of all of the Bible is to get to the new heavens and the new earth. It was good, it turned bad. Our journey is to get all the way to the end where it becomes good once again. It wouldn't be much of a journey if it all said, and it's never going to get any better. If God's story had said it was mucked up right here at this moment in this place, and you are cursed forever, I'm thinking most all of us would stop reading at Genesis chapter 4. Because there's no journey, there's no hope, there's no peace, there's no anything. We are doomed but you see, that's magic of what God says in chapter 3 in Genesis. He says, I'm going to fix all this. How are you going to fix all this? I can't wait to find out. And it plays out through this person, this person, this person, this person, this letter, this story, this gospel, this change, this, this, this. Oh, I see it, I see it, I see it, I see it. And so when Paul is writing this letter, he's saying, listen, wake up, wake up. When he's talking to the church at Ephesus, he's not talking to a, a nice bunch of Christians like yourself. He's talking to people that are rooted in evil. Their natural environment is evil and sinful and fallen. The kinds of things that are going on in Ephesus in that city are incredibly bad. And so when Paul is writing them, he can't just put his hands on his hips and go, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And they go, why? Well, because I'm Paul and I said not to do it. No, 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 that doesn't make any sense. Give us a story. Tell us how it fits in the story. Paul says, I'll tell you a story. Wake up. Wake up. You are people of the light. You were once in the darkness, but now you are the light of the Lord. You are the light of the Lord. This is the middle of your story. You were dead, now you're alive. You were in the dark, now you're in the light. Now act like it. Act like it, you've been given a mission. Act like what you are. You're not dead anymore, and you're not walking in the darkness anymore. Walk in the light. Be the light. Shine the light. And they say, well, Paul, they're turning the pages as fast as they can. Paul, what does it look like to walk in the light? What are the characteristics of a person who is in the light? And he says, that is so easy. The fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And look what he says right after that. And find out what pleases the Lord. Wow. I just simplified your lives exponentially. That's not right. But trust me, I have just simplified your life. Watch this. Pastor, how do I know what to do in this situation? And I say, friend, 
I'm glad you asked me that. Do what pleases the, the Lord. You are reading along with me, right? Do what pleases the Lord. Well, what do I do about this particularly sticky situation? Do what pleases the Lord. Oh, pastor, oh, pastor, I'm, I'm celebrating this. And, and, and how can I know that God was in this? Do what pleases the Lord. The answer to every question. The answer. The answer. Going all the way back to the garden. All the way back to the garden. Hmm. Adam, what do you think we should do here? This snake over here told me Go ahead and try it. Surely we will not die. And Adam, if he had read further on in the story, he would look Eve in the eye and he would say, let's do what pleases the Lord. Let's do what pleases the Lord. Right? Golly. Golly. Come on. Moses comes down with the tablets. All it needed was one commandment, right? Right? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Well, you get rid of that calf and you do what pleases the Lord. It's so simple. And that's the context of the story. Yes, Paul can get wordy. Believe it or not, Paul can use more words than I can use. Paul can get lengthy and wordy and go into excruciating detail. But ultimately, he's telling a story. You are people of the light. Wake up and see that. Wake up and see that. And do. Do. I'm not going to give you a list of things to do. All I'm going to do is say, do what pleases the Lord. Anything else. Anything that you do, think, say that is not pleasing to the Lord is out of character for you. It is not who you are. So stop doing it. And then roll back just a few more verses. See, look at, look at the difference here. If we had approached this passage from verse 3 to verse 4 to verse 5, we'd be out of context. We wouldn't understand the story because it starts like this. But among you, among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such thing, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. How's that? Just start your Sunday. You see, we take those words... We take those words and we have to get past them. We treat, this like, we treat this like a little story and those words are upside down. Clearly, clearly we already understand sexual immorality, greed, coarse words, coarse joking. No, this is okay. We, we, we don't want to be involved in that. We get that. We get that. You see, if you put it in the context of story, if you understand it in the greater scope of what it is, you go, yep, I get that. No sweat. I, I understand why that's inappropriate. And even when I'm tempted to use coarse words, which is never, even when I'm tempted to coarse joking or to greed or to anything else, even when I'm tempted, what do I have to ask myself? Not, uh, should I do this? Can I get away with this? Is there like a technicality I can work around here? None of that. None of that. I don't have to run down the list of the Ten Commandments. I don't have to run down the list of Jesus' two commandments. I don't have to do anything. All I have to do is ask myself, as a person of the light, does this please God? Yes or no? If the answer is no, don't do it. If the answer is no, stop thinking about it. If the answer is no, stop playing with it in your mind. If the answer is yes, go for it. 
Go full bore. If the answer is this pleases God, do it. And do it with gusto. But if the answer is no, what do you do? We don't do it. You see how simple that is? That's the story of all the Bible. See, God is not this, God is not this, this, this mean guy who's standing up there with his giant God hammer looking for any opportunity to smite people. God's first priority, his number one priority, is that he be glorified, that he be lifted up as God, that we do things as his creation that please him. Anything that we do that is contrary to that, anything that we do that brings down his glory to a secondary or a tertiary priority, we don't do that. We don't do that. And, and look at the magic here. Because you understand the story, because you understand the context, you are people of the light. You don't walk in the darkness anymore. Your eyes are open. You are awake. Now you don't have to think about this list of rules. You don't think about, you know, how can I get around? None of that. Does this please God? If the answer is yes, go for it. If the answer is no, step away. If the answer is no, stop playing with it because you're going to get hurt. See, that's the power. That's the power of story. That's the power of understanding whether we're reading a letter or whether we're reading a, a historical account like, like Job or Daniel, whether we're reading prophecy, whether we're processing any of this stuff, it all comes back to where does it fit in the story? Where does it fit in the story? Where do I fit in the story? That's the power of what we're looking at here. Story is powerful because it moves us. If I just come up here and tell you I broke a string, you go, uh, who cares? Get another string and quit whining about it. But when I put it in the context of why things are hard and why things are a struggle and, and how you, you can relate to this, you can relate to have something so simple be broken and all of a sudden you realize, oh my gosh, I use my right hand every day and now it's broken. Put a cast on your right hand or left hand if you're weird, okay? Put a cast on your hand and go through your normal day. All of a sudden, things that you took for granted, all of a sudden, the things you just did without thinking, you have to think of an alternative way to do it for six to eight weeks with this giant thing on your hand. See, we can all put ourselves right here in this story. When we see the Bible unfolding in front of us, when we see the, the Bible unfolding not just as this story in this book, but as our story, it encourages us, it moves us to play our part. And listen, here's the truth. You all have a part in this story. In fact, all the people who have ever been or will be, have a part in this story, whether they realize it or not. And we recognize in story or, or in your favorite movie, your favorite book, however you, you come upon your story, there is, main, there is a main character or, or a couple of main characters, but then there are all kinds of other supporting characters aren't there. Now here's the truth, okay? I am the main character of my story, and you are all secondary characters in my story. Don't feel bad, because it's the reverse for you. You are the main character in your story. But here's what we always have to remember, okay? Just because Rick is a secondary character in my story, I am a supporting character in his story. And for the person who is outside the door now, not knowing Christ, 
They are the main character in their story, and it's up to us to help them find where they fit in the greater story of God, where they fit, what their character is, who God says they are, so that they can find out what God has called them to do. You and I are called on a journey. You and I are called on this this quest, this hero's quest. And we're going to face all kinds of lions, all kinds of fires, all kinds of challenges. For what? For what? To serve out whatever purpose God has ordained for you and for me. That's our purpose in this world. When you and I are fully awake, when we have heeded what Paul says right here, wake up, wake up. When our eyes are open and we're receiving stimuli and we're, we're understanding the words and the movements and we're understanding what people are doing around us, we begin to understand what it is that we're called to do. And it may be different from this moment to the next moment. It may be different tomorrow, but it's those that are awake, those that understand we're playing a part in God's story, that we are secondary characters in God's story, when we get that, man, how much simpler is your life? How much simpler? When we realize that we are not here for ourselves, we are not here to satisfy ourselves, we are not here to do what we want to do, we are here to serve the one who created us. Remember that? Once upon a time, God created the heavens and the earth. And you, God created you. We put things, we, we, we put things in the context of story, not just because it's cute, not just because it's a, it's a convenient way of understanding information. We do it because that's our reality. We're all unfolding a story. We are wired to think in terms of story. And we are wired especially to see story in its complete form, to see the beginning and the middle and the conclusion of the story. If we're feeling out of sorts, if we feel like life doesn't have any meaning, if if we feel like we just can't find that peace and that hope and that joy that we're promised, the reason is, is because we're missing a part of our story. We're missing a part of the truth that we need to have. We're missing a part of the reality that we were intended to know. And that's when we come back to this story. That's when we come back to this book and we find the answers to the part of the story that we're missing. We find out what our quest is, what, what, our, what our hero's journey is, what we do when we face lions, what we do when the fire comes. That's what completes the story for us. One of the biggest parts of God's story is right here on this table. Right here before us, in a thing that we do month after month, Sometimes we do it in an unthinking way. We come to the Lord's table to celebrate, but we come to be reminded of the story. You see, this is, this is a retelling of the story. Once upon a time, God created the heavens and the earth, and in it, He placed humankind. And God said humankind was very good. Very good. Humankind was tempted by evil. And instead of saying, will this please God, they elected to say, this is going to please me. This is going to please us. And so the perfection that God had created, the perfection that God had set out for you and me, that he had intended for us to spend eternity in, was corrupted. Corrupted. And we're cast out of the garden. We are not only cast out of the garden, we are cursed. 
cursed and cast out of the garden. And an angel is placed between ourselves and God with a flaming sword saying there is no way, no possible way for you ever to get back to God, ever, unless you go through me. And that angel is not going to answer to you and me. That angel is not going to answer to anybody but his boss. Only God will tell that angel to move. Once upon a time, you and I had a huge problem. We were separated from the one we were intended to be with forever. And whether we realize it or not, we are wired to want to bridge that gap. We are wired to want to get back with God, usually on our terms, but we, are want, we, are, we always want to get back with God. And God says, there's only one way. There's only one way that you're going to be able to get back with me. And I'm going to have to make that way. I am going to have to solve your biggest problem. I am going to have to solve the thing that separates us. No matter how much you cry out to that angel, he is never going to move. Even if you try to dodge in between the flaming sword, you will never make it. It is impossible for you as fallen humanity, people in the dark, it is impossible for you to ever get back to me. And God says, but, but, I'm going to make a way. I am going to make a way. I am going to pay the price. I am going to make the atoning sacrifice so that you can come back to me. And this is the story. This is a small part of the larger story, but in and of itself, this is the fullness of God's story. It answers all of the important questions that we have. How much does God love you this much? How much does God want to close that breach between us this much? What would God do that you and I cannot do this what lengths will God go to to draw his people back to himself so that we can spend all of eternity in that new heavens and the earth? And the answer is right here. Every month we hold these elements in our hand, the bread and the wine. And if we take them out of context, if we don't, see the story, if we don't process things in terms of the story, they remain just that. It must be the first Sunday of the month we get the bread and the, the, the wine and we take it and then we go on about our business. When we put it in context, when we see that this is our story, this is God's story, we're all a part of this. This becomes the greatest hero of the story. That God didn't send just someone to die. God didn't call you and say, go solve the sin problem. God said, I'm going to take upon myself the full weight and measure of all of the sin of all of humankind. And I'm going to pay the price myself for you so that you and I so that you and I God says my creations so you and I can have happily ever after together 